Hi, welcome to Armchair Philosophy. My name is Ruben, and today we're going to be discussing Cartesian dualism. If you want to seriously study Cartesian dualism, you should first read Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy, as well as his Principles of Philosophy. And it wouldn't hurt to check out the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as well. Descartes' form of philosophy was a heavy skepticism, which he called a strategy of doubt. In short, if something can be doubted, it should be. And you can find a lot of things that can be doubted, including our perceptions, which is why it's used to discredit empiricism in many cases. So what can't be doubted using Descartes' strategy of doubt? Well, you can't doubt that you're doubting. That's paradoxical. And doubting is a method of thinking, so you can't doubt that you're thinking either. You find that you may not be able to doubt those things, but you can doubt basically anything else, which leads Descartes to believe that basically the only thing that you can be sure of is that you exist in some form, whether that's corporeal or non-corporeal, and that you're able to think while doing it in some way. From there, Descartes proposes dualism, the belief that the mind or soul is separate from the body. He believes that since sensory information can be doubted, it should be, which means that the senses of the body don't really matter. Thinking without a body, to Descartes, is entirely possible. The biggest problem facing dualism is known as the mind-body problem, first proposed by Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. The problem is that a mind is a non-corporeal thing to Descartes, whereas the body is still very corporeal. So how do they interact? How can something that doesn't expand and has no mass interact with something that does? Descartes proposed that the place where the soul and the body meet is the pineal gland, but that's not very likely. In reality, no proper explanation to solve the mind-body problem has been proposed yet. Another issue with dualism is that it can easily lead to idealism, and from there, solipsism. Idealism is the stance that reality, as we experience it, is fundamentally mentally constructed. Solipsism, on the other hand, is the stance that everything is mentally constructed. The difference between idealism and solipsism is essentially that idealism still allows for an outside world to exist, whereas solipsism doesn't. In short, solipsism is the stance that only you exist, whereas idealism is the stance that we could all just be plugged into the matrix. But why is it a problem to go towards idealism or solipsism? Well, they're pretty much dead-end philosophies. Once you assume idealism or solipsism, essentially all other arguments become meaningless. In addition, if those around you are fundamentally mentally constructed, then you can't communicate with them. It would thereby be impossible for you to actually argue in favor of solipsism or idealism. Since it's such a dead-end area, it really has no use. But that doesn't mean it isn't true, and some philosophers do identify as idealists and solipsists. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. This has been Armchair Philosophy. Goodbye. Yeah, it's just as you assuming it's nothing but these humans Who like to blame mythology for everything they're doing They pray for non-existent gods to clean up the mess But never take responsibility, just claim it's a test See that religion you've been given is shit and it's all poison And it's partially the reason we bleed and it's all poison so your worldview is poison, and your outlook is poison You can't deny it all you want, but the truth is it's all poison